Hi, welcome to Eye Openers. I'm your host, Brittany Drozd, and each week I bring you insightful conversations with entrepreneurs that will help you make more money, become a strong leader, and build a business culture that you're proud of. Grab your coffee and let's dive in. Hi, everybody, and welcome to Eye Openers. Thanks so much for being on here with me today, Patrick. 100%. <laughs> As you guys know, this show is all about creating business insights and opening your eyes to a new way of seeing the challenges in front of you and the hidden opportunities that exist. But we don't do it alone. We do it with some kind of eye-opening beverage. This <laughs> is flowing and helps us see those things we couldn't already see about ourselves, our leadership, and our business, and our culture. So for me, that drink of choice you guys usually know is coffee. I need a little bit of that caffeine, a little bit of that boost to get me going. Um, and it's still morning for me over here in California. But Patrick, do tell us, what are you drinking today? Cheers. I am drinking vodka. I, I only drink two things, water and vodka. I'm either very hydrated or uh, somewhat lubricated, but I don't do the coffee thing. And and I will say it is afternoon here in the East Coast. So uh uh, it, it's a, it's a, always a good time for me to drink vodka, but, but for those that are concerned about that, <laughs> me, my ex-mother-in-law, um, I, I, it is afternoon. Okay. Okay. Well, folks, you've heard it here first. Vodka is the insightful drink of choice today. So feel free to take a moment for your own. Um, and we're not even going to ask what time it is where you're at. Just go for it. Um, <laughs> I, I'm all about trying new things. So maybe I need to try like a little bit of vodka and see what ideas I come up with. Uh, usually I come up with better dance moves with vodka, but I've never tried it and uh, put a pen to paper or more <laughs> during hours. <laughs> yeah, but who knows? Maybe I'll be able to give clearer directions to people <laughs> when I'm, uh, yeah, with the vodka. So I had a really amazing um, vodka lavender lemonade the other mm -hmm. day. Yeah. I had to say that was like definitely hit the spot. And I guess truth be told, it was like 1130 in the morning. <laughs> it sounds, it sounds like a, a summer drink as we, as we get into yes. to, uh, warmer weather, that, that sounds like the perfect thing. Well, it was like 85 out here and I was by a pool and it just felt like the right thing to do. So yeah, it was the right thing to do. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I agree. Well, um, so cheers to that. Thank you so much for joining us today, Patrick, and enjoy your drink. And for all of you guys, enjoy whatever eye-opening beverage you are using today. But let's get started. we got to give this guy a proper introduction that he is doing, right? And you guys need to kind of know, well, why am I here listening to this guy anyway? Um, Patrick, you are a serial entrepreneur. Love those kind. Um, professional speaker and co-founder CEO of the Charleston-based software agency Code and Trust. After co-founding your first company, GoToTeam, largest stack video crew provider in the U.S., and you took it to 20 offices in around the U.S. 25 years ago. Wow! So you've been at this for a while, this entrepreneur thing. So you definitely have some good stories you're going to share with us, right? Yeah, um, for sure. I have then, all the badges, the good ones and the bad ones. Okay. <laughs> so really, like in total here, you have launched um, six and counting multi-million dollar companies and some in less than two years time. I mean, that's like golf clap. That is an impressive, impressive resume. So thank you so much for being willing to, to show up here and to share your wisdom with us. Um, in addition to all of that, you serve as a co-director of Startup grind DC and currently chair as the Harbor Entrepreneur Center in Charleston, South Carolina. And that's where you are right now, right? Today I'm in Charleston. Yes. I bounce back and forth between Washington, DC and Charleston, South Carolina. Okay. Awesome. Is there anything I missed in that formal bio that you want on? That was, that was pretty fantastic. Uh, my day job currently is, is CEO of Code and Trust. And so that's my biggest focus in helping entrepreneurs. But then, and in my nonprofit hat, as you mentioned, Startup Grind and Harbor Entrepreneur Center, those are, those are my main focuses. Awesome. I love that. Um, I love when people recognize that they can give back to other areas in their community with their skill set and that it would have a really big impact. I also spend 10% um, of my time in a kind of startup hub capacity um, 
called Social Enterprise Greenhouse. And the focus there is in organizations. Some can even be for profit, but it's for, you know, social good in some way. Um, so software that helps aid in like a public health, you know, crisis or something like that. Well, well, being a hardcore capitalist, uh, you know, and and uh, entrepreneur, I, I believe all entrepreneurship is social good, but uh, that I understand completely the the, uh, the difference. Uh, I hear you. I, well, you wait. Yeah. Creating jobs and yeah, and to the economy. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. Um, so I like to kick this off with a really big question because I love to live in really big questions up in the macro at first. And it gives people a really cool idea about, you know, where you're headed and and how you like to think about things. So do tell us, Patrick, if you and I were to speak three years from now, so it's 2025, and I call you up and you say, oh, Brittany, it is so great to hear from you. I'm so glad you called. I can't wait to tell you about what I've done in these past three years. What would you be telling me about? We will absolutely have helped over 100 startups inside of Code and Trust launch in a, in a big way. We already are on the way for that, that and that's our goal uh, over the next three years. And, and we've already got a number of clients that we really do help in that way. But Matt, for us at Code and Trust, uh, our vision is helping entrepreneurs and corporations launch new pieces of software and then deploy them in the world and create real revenue. So we don't count them in our little tick of marker of that we help someone until we really get their product in the world being used by paying customers with real revenue. If, if that doesn't happen, then we don't feel like we've done our, our thing. We, we like to think of ourselves here in, in this particular building as being a bit of a playground where we just get to work on all these really cool entrepreneurial startups and and new software for larger corporations. And we think of ourselves as like a kindergarten teacher, maybe a preschool <laughs> teacher where, you know, she loves her kids and she wants them to be successful and she loves your kids and she wants your kids to be successful. And her fulfilling moment is just kids being successful. And so at Code and Trust, that's our mindset is, it doesn't matter if it's our product, which we have several that we use our, in, in our own dev shop, or it's yours. What our goal is, how do we find market fit? How do we put it into uh, that market, gather iteration feedback, and then go make it better so that uh, entrepreneurs can continue to grow and scale really cool things? Mm -hmm. Awesome. Awesome. Do you want to give us like an example of a project so that because I've, we've talked to a lot of tech people on this show, um, I would love for my audience who are startup entrepreneurs to understand what a great application example is. Well, so we've got a number of different sort of segments of entrepreneurs from the entrepreneur that's just starting with a blank sheet of paper and, mm -hmm. and needs help on you know, marketing and or branding and or thinking through the profit model. So we consult a little on that front end, but really our whole goal is to map out a, a piece of software that really, really flows. Now, one particular client there that makes sense to, to that example uh, is a, a, a perfect entrepreneur that walked in the door, already had an existing business where he was selling services to police stations. He's a well-known uh, expert in the police station market. And he said, guys, if I had a tool that was managing their uh, social media in this way, mm -hmm. I already have police stations that want to sign up. I just need to build this tool and do it correctly. And we took that entire process, helped him bake out the idea, began to put a dev team around it. And within less than, I think, four months, uh, three to four months, he was in the world selling that product and police stations uh, around the United States are now using it. And so to me, that is a perfect example of an entrepreneur that's already running, but then finds a, a innovative product that they can really use and scale. Okay. Okay. So it's best when an entrepreneur has kind of the what in mind and you guys come in and do the how. 
That's exactly right. I, I, normally, we, they'll come along and, and have a, a vision, maybe for a piece of software that needs to do all this. And then we'll say, look, we're really good at this minimum viable product thing. Let's, instead of building all that, let's just build this little part. And, and then let's put it into the market that you want to test. Let's get feedback and then let's iterate. And, and slowly we can build this whole thing. But what we end up finding is that their original vision, once something gets launched into the market, the employees or the customers that are using it, they start feedbacking in ways that the entrepreneur never could have pictured. They start using the tools in ways they didn't picture. And as they see what the possibilities are, they start asking questions like, well, what if the software could do this or that or save me more time in this way? And what ends up happening is instead of building this, we end up building only this, but maybe a whole 20, 30 percent of new things that we never even knew uh, were going to be important in the initial build. So that that's our thought process in helping the entrepreneur to really phase it out and think through instead of trying to build the whole world at one time, really communicate with their client and listen. I mean, that's that's my favorite thing. It's it's ironic to hear I'm doing a lot of talking today, uh, <laughs> but I, I do a lot of public speaking. And as you mentioned, Startup Grind, I just love to hear entrepreneurial startups. It's just my favorite thing uh, to, to dialogue with them and think about what the possibilities could be and then help them move that idea forward. I love it. I love it. It's a really cool energy to be a part of, right? You know, I mean, just the potential that's right there and helping people kind of connect some of the dots to really execute on that and bring it into the world. It's super exciting. It's like a birth. It, the- it really is. I mean, yes. and having, having birthed a number of companies myself, it's not unlike having a, a baby. There's plenty of times when they're in those teenage years that you really just want to walk away. Uh, but that thing is not sustainable yet and you have to stick around uh until they're yep. they're on their own <laughs> that's, right. that's right and i often get called in in a lot of those teenage years so i can speak to that <laughs> and and it sounds like you can too that the, and this is exactly why we have this show and for those of you guys listening like you already know this but this is why i wanted to create a space for people when it feels like you want to walk away when it feels like you want to abandon that teenager that's now talking back to you and not listening um, and it feels like you've created a monster and you're wondering how you got to this very place like this show is about walking through those examples so we're going to hear about you know some of these um these very situations for you, Patrick, and some of your six plus companies that you've launched, what it was like getting through some of those trying times, maybe even just the toddler years where you're really starting to get up and go. And then the teenage years where you have a team and it feels like it's kind of taken on a mind of its own. But before we get into some of that, I want to just carve out a little bit more of where you're going. And we've talked about kind of at scale, serving 100 companies. What is the greatest opportunity based on that answer? So what's the why behind that? You know, what's what's the goal behind the goal there? What we find is when we start out helping an entrepreneur move that forward, it doesn't matter. I'm, I'm being dead serious. It doesn't matter to us if we're operating in our nonprofit capacity with the Harbor Entrepreneur Center and we're, we're taking someone through an accelerator process and, and we're mentoring my, my partners and I, we all mentor for free to help startups and move them forward. And then we might help them develop some of their software or maybe we don't, you know, that's not our end goal. What, what we really get fulfillment out of is knowing that we've pushed forward that number of entrepreneurs. And, and when I speak and communicate with people and then a year, two years, three years down the road, I, I have people come up to me constantly and say, hey, you said something that really made a difference when I needed to hear it. You you pushed me in the way that I needed to be pushed. And I that's just my favorite thing. I, I can't uh, fathom anything more rewarding in my life than having someone that's operating a multi-million dollar business. Uh, I actually had a very dear friend of mine retire and sell her business in the last six months. And uh, she was given this big award 
And as she was receiving the award, she uh, shouted me out and thanked me specifically for helping her through some trying times. And, and there is just simply nothing more rewarding than that. Yeah, that's awesome. It feels so good to get that kind of feedback too. Like, oh yeah, this is why I'm doing it. This is why I'm working so hard, you know, to get this stuff out there. That's really cool. Um, what are some of the skills that you feel kind of got you to this point? And let me preface that with the context of it's really challenging to go from being the technical expert at what you do, being a developer, and now moving into this leadership role of founder and CEO, having the vision that's necessary to carry this through, hiring a team, managing a team. So what do you think are the skills that have really helped you be successful to this point? You know, and you've done it several times, so. Well, not to go too far back, but when I was 17 years old, <laughs> I vividly remember uh, a moment that my uh, father had started a newspaper two years earlier, and he was an expert in the industry. He knew newspapers. I was so ecstatic about being involved in this newspaper. I, I put in $2,500 of my own money. Uh, I became a graphic designer as a part-time job. I learned the new Macintosh computers. That's how old yeah. I am. And I was just so excited. And then I remember when I was 17 him walking into my room and telling me that they were failing, the business was going to close. Ultimately, we would file bankruptcy as a family. We'd lose our family home. My uh, parents get divorced. It was the most trying time in my entire life. I, I, had, I had lived just a really... A uh, great life up until that point. And it put me in a really hard, hard moment. And I know that a lot of people would have taken away from that moment, oh, I'll never start a business. What was my father thinking at 55, uh, deciding that now's the right time to jump into a business? And the reality that I saw, the thing I took away was, I want to be really good at this. I want to start a business and start another business and another business until it, it, I just do it in my sleep and that I, because I just was so energized and the failure drove me, not unlike someone who almost drowns and then becomes an Olympic swimmer, right? It's like at that moment, I really did think, gosh, this burns and it's so bad. But I now know what failure is, and I, and I am going to go and and work hard and and see past that. Since then, I absolutely have had failure. I, I've had moments that just hurt, and and one of my lines is, "I get paid to fail." It's just odd the check shows up on the day I win, right? Everyone in the world looks at the entrepreneur and they go, oh my gosh, you just exited and you made all this money and it's so fantastic and you guys are killing it. And my response is always, where were you four years ago? <laughs> like we, we were, we didn't know what we were doing. We were a total mess and everyone thought we should leave, including me. And, and, but we, we fought through it. We figured it out. We worked on the pivot. Uh, we persevered and now here we are with this, this moment of success. But if you aren't built and you're not willing to walk through the failure, you'll never get to the finish line. It's just not possible. Uh, every entrepreneur I know has those stories uh, that that show that they, they went through the fire in order to get to that exit. Yeah. yeah. Really important, important story. Thanks so much for being willing to share vulnerably about, you know, your upbringing. And uh, because it's true that these narratives are what shape us. Like, it sounds to me like you now entered the space of starting your own businesses thinking, well, failure is not an option. Like, I'm not, that's not going to be my story because I saw how poorly it turned out. So I'm going to do everything within my power to make sure that I walk through these challenges. And so that's like, that's a, a grit, a resilience about you um, that was shaped from these early stories and, you know, over time through experience. So can you tell me about a specific breakthrough or insight, an eye-opening moment that probably came through a challenge 
um, that change the way you see business or your leadership forever? In 1997, we started a business called GoToTeam that you mentioned before. It's in the broadcast television production space. And we were two guys and a truck and an SBA loan of $100,000. Uh, as I mentioned, when I was 17, we filed bankruptcy. So there was no no great Bryant wealth to help me launch that first business. And I loved it. And we worked so hard on that that business and, and went through a lot of trials and tribulations. And within 10 years, uh, we had built the company to a $1 million valuation. I still, to this day, have the document that shows that we were at a 1 million. And, and I was so excited. Uh, I was 34 years old and I, I was just like, man, this is incredible. We, we've hit a million dollar mark and, and it was so exciting. You know who else started in October of 1997? Google. And within <laughs> 10 years, they were publicly traded and we used the name of their company as a verb. And I really had an immense insight shortly after hitting that million mark of, okay, how do we get to 10 and how hard will it be? And, and what will that look like? And as I started to research, I really had this huge epiphany of what makes a business scale quickly. And it's, it's really, you mentioned uh, the six companies that I'm involved in that I now know the formula. And I really love talking to people about that formula and sharing it because it really, to me, is that thing I wish I had known. You know, you know, there are these things where my son was joking yesterday. He's he's filling out uh, paperwork to start his first LLC, and uh, a as I was telling him kind of the, some of the steps and processes and helping him do it, and uh, he goes, "I just don't understand why people don't teach this in school." Right. Like this seems like pretty valuable information. Uh, and and I agreed with him completely. But then I immediately in my mind went to it's amazing that I went through all these business classes as a student and not one of them taught me the basic rules of math for scaling a business very, very quickly and what valuation is going to uh, change based on the kind of innovative, scalable thing that you're working on. Uh, so that was really the the biggest breakthrough for me was being a young entrepreneur with GoToTeam and seeing how we could go scale this thing into offices around the United States. Well, can you share some of those things with us? Uh, well, absolutely. The, the first thing is scalability. Uh, having something that allows you to sell uh, that product or service around the world repeatedly, right? If, mm -hmm. if, I, can, if I can sell this thing uh, it, all around the world, then now I can have much bigger volume with it, it, even you know, better uh, opportunities for my employees and for me to grow personally. And so really it goes back to that product and service and really thinking through what are we going to offer and how is it going to be scalable? Uh, I tell the story of a chiropractor. If you've got a nice chiropractor practice in Charleston, South Carolina, let's say you got three offices, you're living a pretty good life. I'm not saying that's a bad idea and let's do it. Yeah. However, if I can convince that chiropractor, even on the side as his next growth moment, find something scalable that is a product, let's say a medical device or a piece of software that mm -hmm. helps people in the chiropractic area. Now, all of a sudden, I can go sell that software to every chiropractor in the world, or I could go sell that medical device to every chiropractor's patient in the world. Now, I have changed the scale game completely, uh, and, and that's what I spent a lot of time talking about when I'm public speaking is how to look at that scale and combine it with new innovations that will allow us to really blow up that business fast. Amazing. Amazing. Okay. This is a great idea. I'm 
full disclosure, I have been thinking about how I'm going to do this the whole time we've been on the phone. I love it. Yes. Why have some ideas I want to run past you after this call? <laughs> I, I did that. That's my number one question is, Patrick, how do I communicate with you about some ideas? And the answer is that I'm very open to those conversations. We actually built a scale uh, on our website to have that dialogue in particular uh, at codeandtrust.com because we literally have this conversation all day long and, and just love it. Awesome. I love it. I love it so much because really with the way that we all operate, right? Like I have my phone right here, it's full of apps, like it's full of things that just make my life easier or allow me to, you know, have my hands in so many things. Um, not only as a business owner, or as a parent, as a person in the community, somebody who needs to do banking or just anything, you know? And, um, and when you think if you if you're an expert in your industry, then you have definitely spent time thinking about, you know, what are the needs of my customers? And and you probably have a process that you didn't even think that you have. Right. But if you spend time thinking about, wow, like I do these same things in the same order with 90 percent of my customers, then there is your product. Right. You're point. absolutely correct. And you're almost quoting Paul Graham, uh, who is one of the most brilliant entrepreneur advisors in the in the world. And, and Paul's, uh, I'm going to paraphrase, but uh, Paul's uh, entire thought process around that is, if you're an expert to what you just said, by definition, you're living in the future compared to everyone else, because you already know things about that industry before other people know uh, right now, I'm driving a full self-driving autonomous vehicle. So by definition, I know things about driving an autonomous vehicle that people that aren't uh, don't know, right? So I'm living in the future, uh, and, and there's plenty of people living much further in the future with autonomous vehicles than me, but I'm right there in the, in the, in the future. And then the question is, okay, now that you're, you've put yourself in a position you're living in the future, then all you got to do is look left and look right. And look for the things that when the others catch up, what they'll need, right? Uh, we're, we're going on a trip and I'm, I'm a few miles ahead and I'm just looking around going, hey, you know, when they get here, they're going to need water. They're going to need supplies. They're going to need a tent. All I got to do is go get those things and position them right here. And when they catch up, I'm, I'm set and, and, and winning. Love it. Love it. The first thought I have is if it's a fully autonomous self-driving vehicle. Now, what am I free to do? What am I going to be doing when I'm in my car? Absolutely. And I, I, I think that's the key, right? What, what, will, what will we want to be doing in that car and how will we do it? And, and what uh, opportunities will that, that change uh, as we all free up that amount of time, which I think will be the most interesting thing. I mean, just the idea of, of driving a two hour trip and, and, having two hours totally back to yourself, uh, I think is, is intriguing. Yeah. I can't even imagine. Um, so I could go down that rabbit hole. I'm not going to, I'm going to pull us back <laughs> instead of just ideating on products we could come up with for that. Right. Um, so let's talk about another vulnerable place. Um, because I think it's so important to assess and people love to not assess. What would you identify as one of your greatest weaknesses right now? And, and what are you doing about it? Well, I, my biggest uh, growth moment is continuing my process of scaling the team that works with me. Uh, I, am, I am in a constant state of figuring out delegation and or how other people can take on projects that we're working on in a way that I'm no longer involved in that. And it's so intriguing to me to continue to get good at that, where I'm empowering the people on my team to do all kinds of activities uh, that I just never, I, I, I would have absolutely thought I needed to do those things in the past. And now I, I, I'm slowly, especially with technology, finding these ways to really help empower other people on the team to take off those pieces. And, and really hone in, as I think we all should, on our unique skill. What is that thing that we are critically good at that no one else can do? And then when we find that, then carving out every part of our day where 
that's all we're doing, right? Uh, and and I know that I'm particularly uh, enjoy and and really feel like people appreciate my talents in the world when I'm out having these conversations about ideas and moving it forward and helping people see vision and all those things. And I'm not that good at the details. I, I don't love to manage people. I don't love to map up a five-year strategic plan, but there are people in my life that are really good at those things. And so the more that when those present themselves and I can push them uh, forward and help them have the role they want, uh, then it really does just change the game entirely. Really, really great point. I'm so glad you brought that up because so many people I work with are at that inflection point where they are now the bottleneck. Even when you have a team of 10, it, like it happens again and again and again. It's like something you have to just keep pushing through and pushing through whatever stage you're at in your business. Um, so can you give me an ex a specific example of something recently where you knew you had to get this off your plate um, and then you were able to delegate that to somebody else? Something that felt impossible. Like, of course I have to be doing this thing. Yes. Well, I, I knew that I need to be in a dialogue uh, on a particular acquisition that we're working on for uh, our event ticketing business. And we, we knew we had to do it. We had everything that was there. And I really did feel like, oh, I've got to be the one to, to take all these calls, go communicate uh, and work with these people. And, and honestly, it was that, that thing that I then carved off and said, you know what, I don't, I don't really need to be involved until this point. So how can I help someone else see all the things that we're going to do below that and then click them off up until I'm involved and or that I, I certainly did not just give the task and walk away. There were points in there that I needed to be involved, right? So it needed to be, okay, we're going to go target acquisition these eight companies. I need you to find the companies. I need you to do all the data. I need, I need to be on the first call. And then immediately after the first call, our goal is to put it on to the next person, right? So how could we map out all the steps that needed to happen there, plug the right people in and pull me out uh, from, from really doing a lot of that, that data work that I, I would have uh, otherwise definitely done. And, but then it would have been a monumental task that was going to take you know, three months to accomplish with my other priorities. Instead, we, we accomplished it within a week because multiple people had their piece to the pie. Really great example. Thank you for illustrating that. You know, I think why so many people struggle with this, myself included, is that it's something you enjoy oftentimes. The ta you know, you probably love data. I mean, you know, to some degree, right? It's probably really shaped why you're good at what you guys do. Um, but it's hard to separate that, um, that like zone of competence or zone of, of excellence versus the zone of genius. And for those of you who are avid listeners, you've heard me talk about this before, but really, like you mentioned, Patrick, that zone of genius is something that that is truly your special, special skill that you were just made to do. It lights you up. You get in workflow like so easy. Time flies by. And it's just like I could talk one-on-one -on -one with people for hours and just be fully engaged. I just absolutely love it. I'm constantly looking for ways to provoke your thinking or create more insight. And it's just what I love to do. And that's why I have people who help me just go from call to call to call because that's what I love to do. Um, and so it, it's hard because I also love getting in the research and I also love like sales and business development and all this other stuff. So it's really challenging to pull yourself out of the things that you like that you're probably good at, but it's just not that specific, super niche down, you know, task or component that really makes all the difference in your business. I love the way that you put that. I, in the early days of GoToTeam, I was a video editor. That was one of the tasks and one of my professional skills. And I had these uh, times, I was also a producer and, uh, you know, very involved in uh, crafting stories. And I had a moment when I was uh, about that, less than that 10 year mark I mentioned, let's say maybe five or six years into our business, where I, I had stayed up one night until uh, 2 a.m. 
helping someone do a video edit for a particular one of our projects that I had gotten sucked into. And I, as I'm leaving our office at 2 a.m. and knowing that I had to be back at 9 a.m. To, to do my full you know, management work duties for the company and all the things I had to accomplish, I thought, why am I here editing? I like we have we have full time editors. There's a, I don't know why I'm here. What what were the circumstances under which I ended up saying yes to this? And I on that drive home, I thought back. What are the projects that I've been working on? And you know what I found is that I had done one project that I had personally decided to help the people with every quarter for the last three quarters. And as I saw that pattern, I noticed in myself that I was choosing to do it specifically to your point exactly, because it was fun to me and I loved the creative process and it was an enjoyable because they were always clients that I enjoyed being with. But even though all those things are, are good, I needed to let that go in order for our company to grow and for me to go focus on things that I, I could really be uh, a change maker on. And so thank you. Your, your way of putting it is, uh, is perfect. And I agree. Thanks for that. Yeah, it, it, it makes a big difference. So for those of you sitting in that right now, if you're listening to this at 2 a.m., just take a pause and reflect how, why am I here? How did I get here? And how can I make it different? And sometimes it's so hard to do by yourself. So, you know, solicit some help around that, like call someone who you trust and ask them how, how do they see it, that it would be possible for you to delegate it? Cause sometimes we're too close to it. And we think of ourselves sometimes as more important than we need to be. And it can be so helpful to just see somebody else's perspective on that. That's right. And that's why you're here to, you know, see different perspectives. So Patrick, in closing, I want to just thank you so much for being here. Thanks for being willing to share honestly and candidly about what it really means to be an entrepreneur and to be in the entrepreneur game for decades. You know, it just, it, I can tell you're so seasoned. You talk about it with not just a confidence, but like a, a self-assuredness that there's going to be more challenges. You're not immune to them, but it's just about that mindset about how you approach them um, and that stick to uh, of getting through. How can people find you? How can they how can they find Code and Trust? You know, how can they get in touch with you? The best way is codeandtrust.com. Uh, certainly, I, my information is on there. They can send an email and and connect. And also, of course, LinkedIn if they Google. Patrick Bryant, Charleston, they will have no problem finding me, but LinkedIn's a good, a great spot that I connect with a lot of people as well. Awesome. So for those of you catching this live, you'll already see him linked in that, um, but we will make sure if you're watching the podcast after the live episode, we'll make sure that's in all the show notes so you guys can get in touch. Thank you so much, Patrick, for, for doing this again. It was really valuable for me. I know I've got some ideas percolating. I hope my audience does as well. And, um, and I hope you guys reach out to him if you do have some questions. He's been super helpful to date. So until next time, guys, keep drinking those eye-opening drinks, whether it's vodka or coffee. No judgment here. No, we're not going to ask you what time of day it is. And, um, and join us again soon. And if you really, really like this, make sure to subscribe so you can catch us next time. Thanks again, everybody. Have a great weekend. Thanks for joining us this week on Eye Openers. Make sure to visit brittanydroz.com slash podcast for this week's show notes. And if you found value in today's episode, I would so appreciate you giving us a rating on Apple Podcasts or share it with a friend. Also, don't forget to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. This all helps to support the show.